You're now experiencing data with Brian O'Neill. Experiencing data explores how product managers, analytics leaders, data scientists, and executives are looking at design and user experience as a way to make their custom enterprise data products and analytics applications more useful, usable, and valuable. And now, here's your host, the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, Brian O'Neill. All right, everybody, welcome back to Experiencing Data. This is Brian T. O'Neill, your host. And today I have James Taylor on the line, who's not the guitarist, not the, and I'm sure you hear this all the time. I really like James Taylor, actually. You are the CEO of Decision Management Solutions, a little bit different. Tell us, what is decision management and what does it mean to have solutions in the decision management space? Sure, so it's great to be here. So Decision Management Solutions, the bottom line here is if you're a large company, and you have a high volume transaction where it's not immediately obvious what you should do in response to that transaction, then you have to make a decision. And you have to make a decision quickly, at scale, reliably, consistently, transparently, all those good things. And we specialize in helping people build solutions to that problem. How do you build software solutions primarily that address those issues and let companies handle their decision making more quickly, more precisely, more consistently? Got it, got it. And I, I know one of the things you talk about in your work, which appealed to me and made me want to reach out to you is I use the framing, uh, the last mile. We talk about this a right. lot in the work, which is ensuring that when the, when the human beings come and, t and touch, use, interface with the systems and interfaces that you've created, that's kind of the make or break point where technology goes to succeed or die. So talk to me about this starting at the end point from your perspective. I want to hear how you, you frame this in your, your own words. Sure. So our experience, and this is backed up by various surveys, is that the typical analytical project has problems at both ends. Uh -huh. they, people tend to define an analytical solution, frankly, that will never work because it's the wrong solution, that's solving the wrong problem. Or they build a solution that in theory would work, but they can't get it across the last mile. And our experience is that you can't get it across the last mile if you don't begin by thinking about the last mile. And so, you know, both problems are in fact indicative of the same problem, which is that I need to understand the business problem I'm gonna solve before I develop the analytics and I need to make sure that I deploy the analytics so that it solves that business problem. And for us, what we would say is, look, what, ask people why they wanna use data. Why do they wanna use analytics? And they will always tell you, well, I wanna improve decision-making. Well, just decision-making in general or a specific decision. Well, normally, a specific decision or a set of specific decisions. And we're like, okay, so do you understand how that decision is made today? Who makes it? Where do they make it? How do they tell good ones from bad ones? You know, what are the constraints and regulatory requirements for that decision? If you don't understand those things, how are you gonna build an analytic that will improve that? And so we like to begin, we, like to, we often joke that you have to work backwards. Instead of saying, here's my data, here's the analytics I can build from my data, uh, now I'm deploying those analytics to see if I can improve decision making. You have to say, what's a better decision look like? Yeah. How do I make the decision today? What analytics would help me improve that decision? Now, how do I find the data I need to build those analytics? Because those are the ones that will actually change my business. So we often talk about working backwards or, or uh, the other phrase I use a lot is, I misquote the late Stephen Covey. You have to begin with the decision in mind. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm completely in agreement because the decision making forces you to also really focus on the problem and to get clarity around, like, what does a positive outcome look like for the people who care, the ones right. that are sponsoring the project or, or creating the application or whatever the thing is. It forces you to get really concrete about that and, and to get everyone bought in on, like, what success looks like. And it just makes the whole technology initiative usually a lot easier because there's not going to be a giant surprise at the end about like, what is this? Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this doesn't yes. help me do anything. You know? Exactly. <laughs> now, I, I, have, I have lots of stories about this, as I'm sure you do. I think one of my favorites is this guy who called me up and said, do my company build churn models? And I'm like, well, yeah, we can help you build a churn model. I'm, I'm curious, you know, why do you need a churn model? You know, what is it for? And he said, well, we have a real customer retention problem and a churn model will help me solve this problem. And I said, okay, so humor me, what decisions are you responsible for? What are you responsible for in, in the organization? And it turned out he ran the save queue in a telco. I don't know if you've heard the expression save queue, but it basically means the people you get transferred to in the call center when you say you want to cancel your, your service, right? And so these are the people whose job it is to persuade you not to cancel your service. Right. 
So he's telling me this, and I said, that's it, that's your scope. Yes, that's the only bits I can change. And I said, okay, in that case, I can give you a free churn model. You can, yes, churn equals one. Yeah. <laughs> because absolutely everyone you speak to has said they want to cancel their service. Therefore, they are at a 100% risk of churn. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yes, you have a churn problem. Yeah. No, a churn model will not help you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other models might. But that's not going to help you because way too late for a churn model, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and, and I know that design thinking is part of your, your work. You have a flavor of that that I want you to go into. And, and maybe this question will force you to do that. But one thing that I kind of have a distaste for in this, this space, in the, in the data science space, when we're talking about models and deploying models is thinking about operationalization as something that's distinct from the technology building process. You know, I tend, when we think about design and the systems design, we would say, well, that's integral to the success of the product. And it may not be the job of the literal data scientists to build the model to be responsible for all of that, but to not even be considering it or participating in that, or for the, whoever the, what I would call the product manager, the data product manager, whoever the person is in charge of this, this is a real problem if you're if you're just mm -hmm. working in isolation here. So do you think operationalization should really be a second and distinct step from the technology or should that be integral to thinking about it holistically like as a system? This is right. a whole system. There's multiple human beings, departments, technologies, engineering, all kinds of stuff involved with it. Right. What do you think about that? I don't, am I crazy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about operationalization, but, but we would very much, as you do, re regard it as part of the project, right? If you haven't operationalized it, you're not done, right? One of my pet peeves is where, where data scientists say, well, I'm done. And I'm like, well, no, you're not. I had this great call. A journalist called me the other day, and she was asking about an interview, and I was being my usual cynical self about AI and machine learning. And she said, well, how do you, uh, how do you explain notable AI successes. And I'm like, well, give me an example of one. And she said, well, the AI that successfully identified tumors in radiology scans that humans had missed, right? And I'm like, I'm going to challenge your definition of success. She said, how can that not be a success? I said, because as far as I know, they haven't treated one patient differently because of it. No patient is healthier today because of that AI. Therefore, yeah. they're not done yet. They may well yet make it successful. And I'm intrigued by the potential, but it is not yet a successful AI because it has not yet improved anybody's health outcome. And if that was its intent, then it's not done. Because I'm with you. It's not operationalized. We're not finished. You can't declare victory you know, <laughs> at that point. You, know, you have to be you know, finishing it. And, and we often use the CRISP-DM framework, you know, the business understanding you know, all the way around. And one of our key things is when you get to the evaluation stage, one of the reasons you need to understand the decision-making is that you should be evaluating the model in terms of its impact on the decision-making, not just on its match to the training data or its lift or yeah, the theoretical sort of mathematical you know, rock and all these things. Those are all important, but you should then also say, and when used in the decision-making, which we understand well enough to describe how it would change thanks to our model, because we started by <laughs> understanding that, yeah. This will be the business impact of deploying the model. And if you can't do that, then why did you bother building the model? You know, it's not anybody else's job but yours to explain the impact of your model on the business problem that your model is designed to solve. <laughs> so I'm with you. It is a separate set of tasks that need to be included, but the idea that you're going to have a separate organization do it, I disagree completely with that. I think that's it's got to be part of the machine learning team. And I think machine learning teams need to hold their members accountable, you know, models are successful and you get like a tick very good on your, on your resume or your, your internal job description and so on when the model is deployed yeah, and not before, right? You're, 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 I don't care how talented you are. If I can't deploy the models you build, well, then there's a problem, right? Yeah. You know, I, I need you to be engaged in that process. And, and I think that if you read the stuff about ML ops, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, ML ops and, and data ops, uh, analytic ops and stuff like that. And I read these descriptions and I'm like, this is all stuff the IT department already does. There's not a single task in this list of ML ops things that isn't done already by the IT department. So the reason you want to add this to your ML tool is because you just don't want to talk to the IT guys. Mm. You know, if you were willing to actually go talk to the IT guys 
they've got data pipelines. They've got ways to do many of these things. Now, some of them aren't scaled for the kinds of things that analytics people need, right? So I'm not saying it's a complete thing, but just this idea that somehow that the machine learning team has to like create all this stuff from scratch, I think it's just because they don't want to talk to the IT guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to stay in my little bubble and do my little thing and not have to like, you know, interact with people. And I think that's a, in a big company, in the end, you're going to have to talk to the IT guys. So you may as well like get over it and go talk to them now, right? Yeah. Do you think that's a, I mean, to me, that sounds like a, a management problem. It's either hiring the wrong people or not providing the right training or not explaining like, this is what the gig is. <laughs> the gig <laughs> yeah. is really the, it's this story. It's this change. It's this change that we want to push out. It's about making the change. It's not about exercising technical proficiency alone. That is not what the game is that we're playing on this team. If you want that, there's a place to go for it. But yes, right. I feel like this is just a skill that it's not, it's not natural because there, there's a lot of other skills that come into play into doing that well. And it, it's, I don't know if that's your experience as well. And I, I wonder if that's just a management change that needs to happen. If it's coming out of people individually that want to do this. I mean, I, I have students in my seminar sometimes that come in and I would say they're curious, but oftentimes it might be like a, a leader wants them to develop this skill outright. And they're a little bit resistant to it because they think they're there to do something else. Yeah. which is more academic in nature to, from my perspective. That's how I was like, this sounds like academic research work that you want to do with perfecting right. a model or, and, and then you end up with these technical, what I call technically right, effectively wrong, right? Yes. It's 92% accurate with 1% use. Yes, you know? exactly. <laughs> now, I, I would agree with you. I think it is a management problem. I think that the big challenge with this often is that the senior management have thrown up their hands. It's all too complicated. I'm not going to engage with it. And so they say, well, here's our data. Tell us something interesting, right? Or they hire people who, who think it is their job to use machine learning and AI and, and do these cool things. And, and they go off and do them. I remember talking to one big company and hired this big group of AI and machine learning folks. They were spending a ton of money on AI and machine learning. And we had a conversation with a, a group where we were proposing a slightly different approach. And they were like, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to use the AI and machine learning to, group to do it. And I'm like, okay, well, help me understand how they're going to help solve this problem. And so I, I'm pushing on them. Well, how are you going to solve this problem? Well, we're going to use AI and machine learning. Uh, I know. How, how are you going to solve this person? She's sitting right here. She runs this claims group. How are you going to solve the problem she just described? You know, what kinds of machine learning and AI? Applied how? Well, we're going to use AI and machine I mean, really, this person had no idea, yeah. had no interest in the business problem. Yeah. We're going to use AI and machine learning. We've got a big budget, you know, big team, rah, rah us. And I'm like... Okay, you, you, you know, your job here is to apparently to spend money on machine yeah. learning and AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah and this not in you... fact to make any. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like, do you want, and I think especially for leaders in this space, it's like, do you want to be associated with a cost center or do you want to be a center of excellence and innovation? Yeah. And I think right. the C-level team is thinking that AI is a strategic thing. We have all this data. Everyone else is doing it. I need to be on the race. And some of this is hype cycle stuff. Yeah. Some of this is legitimate that they should be thinking about this. But the assumption is we'll hire this team and then I'm going to get all this magic dust falling from the yeah. sky. Like, and it doesn't happen that way. Like with any technology, it really doesn't happen that way. You have to think about operationalizing it. You have to think about the experience of the people using it. And what's the story? How do you change people's mindset? How do you change existing behaviors and exactly. you know what's this fear people's fear and trust there's all these aspects that are human things many years ago when i was a young consultant i, I was working uh, writing a methodology for uh, it projects right and uh, we merged it with an organizational change methodology and this old organizational change consultant he seemed really old at the time but he's probably my age now right <laughs> but at the time i was young so he seemed really old and he said james you technology people are so funny he said you think it's all a technology problem it's always an organizational change problem. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm old. I have to say that he, he had a certain point, right? That, yeah, you know, it's always going to be an organizational change problem. And that is, in fact, the number one issue, right? And yeah, we, we lovingly refer to our customers as big, boring customers. You know, they're yeah. big, boring companies, right? And if you're a big, boring company, and most people work for big, boring companies, you're, you're constrained by all sorts of things, right? I was just talking to an analytics head, very, very smart guy, very interested in machine learning, works at a big bank. And one of the teams that he's working with, one of the platform providers said, well, uh, when it comes to making offers to people based on events, you know, responding to events with an offer, why don't you just let the machine learning, you know, learn what works best? And he's like, 
So if you're looking at, the, say, the mortgage page, to begin with, it will just randomly pick an offer, a car loan, a savings account. Yeah. Right? It's got nothing to do with the fact that you've spent the last 30 minutes looking at the mortgage. That's not going to give that customer a good sense of the bank. Right? I need to constrain those offers to at least the ones that make some kind of sense. And if I know which customer it is, I need to at least eliminate the ones that they're not allowed to buy. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Or a product uh, they have already. Or a product they have already. <laughs> or a product that they can't have because they don't have another product that it relies right. on. Or a product they can't have because they've already got another product that's considered by the regulator to be a comparative product and you can't own both, right? And on and on, right? And so, no, I'm not just going to let the machine learning model pick. I want to decide some structure for this. And then I want the machine learning to help me get better at it. Right? And so that's a, a persistent theme with us. It's like, you know, machine learning is not a substitute for hard work, right? For thinking about the problem, understanding your business, doing those things. It's a way of adding value. It doesn't substitute for, for things, right? It, it adds more insight, more precision, new opportunities and so on. But this idea for most big companies that they can throw out what they already know and just replace it with machine learning, I think is is, as you say, part of the hype cycle. You know, they're, they're just going to spend a lot of money and get nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me about how you, you implement design thinking or what, whatever you want to call sure. it, this process of human-centered design into your work. And why does it matter? Like, what right. have you seen results from it? Or what, how does it connect? Is there, are clients resistant to that? Sure. So one of the things we find is that, you know, obviously, the principle of design thinking, you know, there's several things, right? You want to be very focused on the people involved, and you want to try and prototype things, and, you know, you want to show people, not tell them. Yeah, you know, all this kind of standard design thinking stuff. And what we found is when it comes to decision making, because if you're trying to do analytics, you're trying to improve decision making. Well, you can prototype UIs if there's going to be a UI involved and stuff. But what you really want to do is you want to understand the decision making, because that's the thing you're trying to redesign, right? And so we use decision modeling. So decision modeling is a graphical notation for drawing out how you make a decision. It's a sort of, you know, a way of sketching out what are the pieces of your decision and the sub-decisions and sub-sub-decisions. And yeah, just like a process model describes a process and a data model describes a database, a decision model describes a decision, right? And so you lay out this decision model and we always begin by asking people, how do you decide today? Right? Don't tell me what you'd like to do or what you think you should, but what do you do today? What should you do today? And obviously, we say should because sometimes there's inconsistencies or whatever. But we really try and start with that and define that. And what we find is that no one's ever asked them this before. People have said, what data do you need? Or what kind of analytics could we give you? Or how would you like the UI to look? Or what kind of report do you need? But no one's actually said, so how do you decide to pay this claim and not pay that claim? How do you decide to lend Brian money for a car and not lend James money for a car? How do you decide? And it turns out, like at any design thinking, people really like to tell you, right? <laughs> so, uh, so they tell us, and then we build a decision model. So now we have a model that's a visual representation that they can say, yes, that looks like how we decide or how we ought to decide today. And this gives us a couple of things. It means we can actually prototype the decision making because we can say, well, okay, let's take a real example of a real customer. How would you decide their lifetime value? How would you decide their, their credit risk? How would you decide which products they've already got? How would you, yeah, we can work our way through the model, essentially prototyping how that decision would really work for a real example. And so you can really get a very robust understanding of, okay, this is really where you are today, how you decide today. Well, now you can ideate. We have this game we play called the if only game. And we'll say, well, okay, fill in the blanks. If only I knew blank, I would decide differently. And then people go, oh, hmm. Well, if only I knew who had an undisclosed medical condition. If only I knew who wouldn't pay me back. If only I knew you know, who had a life insurance with another company. Okay, well, now the machine learning team can go, okay, so what if we can predict that and how accurately we might have to predict it? And then you can ask all sorts of interesting questions because I'll give you a concrete example. We did this exercise with some folks in disability claims. And they were trying to decide if they could fast track the claim. Fast tracking just means we just sort of send you a few emails and then we pay you, right? We don't go through a big interview, have a nurse come visit, the whole, whole production. And they're just trying to fast track these claims. And so we asked this if only questions. She said, well, if only we knew whether your claim matched your medical report, right? You're claiming for something. Yeah, you know, you've broken your leg or whatever it is. Does your claim match the medical report that you attach to the claim? In other words, does the medical report say 
you're very organic. And the analytics team were like, well, we'd started looking at text analytics to analyze the medical reports, but we assumed you'd want to know all the things that the medical report said. You know, what are the things wrong with you that are in this medical report? And she's like, no, 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 no. I, I just need to know if the one you're claiming for is in the medical report. And the analytics team is like, oh, well, that's a lot simpler. You know, that's, that's a much easier problem, right? Because you don't care, like, uh, you know, if you have diabetes or you're overweight or you're failing to take your meds, I, I actually don't care. I just care that you have, in fact, broken your leg, right? You know, okay. And they said, all right, so if we did that, how accurate would it have to be? And she famously said, better than 50-50. And they practically fell off their chairs. Right. And, they, 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 and I kid you not, they made her say it again while they recorded her. Wow. Because they didn't really believe her. And she's like, no, I mean, it's a fast track process. We've already got other bits of the decision that eliminate people who've got mental health issues or long-term care issues or, you know, we never fast track those. So we're just looking at the ones which we might fast track. And for the ones we might fast track, if the medical report probably says you have a broken, you know, the same thing you're claiming for, that's good enough to fast track you. Because we've got steps later to double check all this stuff, right? We're not going to pay you because of this decision. We're just trying to fast track it and avoid cost in the process. And, you know, frankly, it's a sniff test. You know, as long as it's better than 50-50, we're good. So 60-40, yeah, something like that would be great. And of course, the analytics team, I, I talked to them afterwards, and I'm like, so you originally had this plan to build a minimum viable product to come up with uh, I forget if it was 85 or 95% right. accurate assessment of all the conditions in the medical report that was going to take you the rest of the year. This was like in February or something. How long is this going to take you? They're like, you know, we'll probably be done in a couple of weeks. Because <laughs> you know? we just need to do a very rough and ready. You say this is what's wrong with you. It's got an ICD-10 code. How likely is it that this medical report includes that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know? And so we collapsed the minimum of our product from nine months to, you know, a few weeks, you know, because that's what she actually needed to improve that decision. And that to me was like, okay, this is why we do it this way. <laughs> you know? Did you, yeah. did you get a sense of like skin crawling that like 50, 50, <laughs> but that's just like guessing practically. Was there a sense that like, oh, yeah. how could you possibly accept a double F minus, like if <laughs> yeah, we're in school, exactly. right? That would be yeah. like, you're so far from failing. And it's like, no, just 51 is good. Exactly, exactly. Did that make no, people it was, skin it was crawl? Or? <laughs> yes, for sure. The group split into two. There's definitely the ones who are like, cool, that means we'll be able to get some value out of this quickly, get a minimum viable product, more agile thinking types, and we'll, go on, we'll be able to go on to something else, right? And there were other people who's, who were clearly extraordinarily uncomfortable with the whole, <laughs> the whole notion, who were very uncomfortable with the idea that this would be useful. And were like, well, surely a more accurate model would be better. I'm like, well, probably, but probably not a lot better. Yeah. She's only got two choices. She can fast track it or not fast track it. And at some point, the extra work you spend to make it more accurate is just not worth the payoff, right? Are you tired of building data products, analytics solutions, or decision support applications that don't get used or are undervalued? Do customers come to you with vague requests for AI and machine learning only to change their mind about what they want after you show them your user interface, visualization, or application. Hey, it's Brian here, and if you're a leader in data product management, data science, or analytics, and you're tasked with creating simple, useful, and valuable data products and solutions, I've got something new for you and your staff. I've recently taken my instructor-led seminar, and I've created a new self-guided video course out of that curriculum, called Designing Human-Centered Data Products. If you're a self-directed learner, you'll quickly learn very applicable human-centered design techniques that you can start to use today to create useful, usable, and indispensable data products your customers will value. Each module in the curriculum also provides specific step-by-step -step instructions, as well as user experience strategies specific to data products that leverage machine learning and AI. This is not just another data viz or design thinking course. Instead, you'll be learning how to go beyond the ink to tap into what your customers really need and want in the last mile so that you can turn those needs into actionable user interfaces and compelling user experiences that they'll actually use. To download the first module totally free, just visit designingforanalytics.com 
the course. Tell me about prototyping and design. You talked about decision centric dashboarding as well. So talk to me about when you get down into the interfaces and, and how do you prototype and test this stuff like to know that it's going to work before you commit. So one of the things we focus on is we're, we're typically focused on high volume decisions, right? So mm -hmm. what we have found is that when you've got a transactional kind of decision, a decision about a customer, about an order, about a transaction, you're much better off applying analytics to an automated part of the decision than to the human part of the decision. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to do is we'll build these decision models and then we'll identify an automation boundary. Which bits of this model can we automate? And then we'll try and capture the logic for that decision making as it stands today, right? So that now we're not making the decision necessarily any better than the way we used to, but now we're making it uh, repeatedly and repeatably, you know, consistently, and we can start to generate data. So we, we start to save off how we made that decision. So we'll say, well, we made this decision to pay this claim because we decided your policy was in force, we decided the claim was valid, we decided there wasn't a fraud risk, and we decided there wasn't wastage. And we decided your policy was enforced by deciding these things. And we decided that your claim was valid by deciding these things. And we have that whole structure for every transaction. Now, at that point, we haven't done any analytics, but we have got control of the decision rate. Then we start to say, okay, which bits of this decision model could be made more accurate by applying machine learning or prediction or so on, right? And then what we're trying to do is then tweak the rules, take advantage of that new prediction, right? So a rule might have said, you know, I've got a set of red flags. If you've ever lied to me before, if you went to a doctor who's lied to me before, <laughs> if you went for a service that I have lots of issues with, then it got red flagged. And so it's gone to, you know, it's going to get reviewed. But if it didn't get a red flag, I'm interested in whether you could predict that it should have got a red flag. So this is the first time this doctor's lied to him, but he's got the characteristics of a doctor who's going to lie. This is the first time you've lied to us, but you have the characteristics of someone who might lie to us. This is the first time we've had this treatment, but it smells like the kind of treatment that gets red flagged a lot, right? So I don't have an explicit reason to reject this claim, but I'm, perhaps you can predict that I probably ought to at least look at it. And then we change the rules slightly. So now the rules say, well, if you had a red flag, it goes to review. And if you didn't have a red flag, but this predictive model says, smells bad, looks too much like an outlier, looks too different from the usual run-of-the-mill stuff, then we'll review it anyway. And so you start to add value by identifying things that were missed in the current explicit version of it. So we very much focus on automation first and improvement second. So to your point, you know, we will prototype the models, but then generally the next step is to automate a chunk of it so that we can start to run simulations and automate the decision-making and then start applying analytics to it. And the dashboards we build are mostly about how we made decisions, not about making a decision. It's like, here's a dashboard that shows you how the decisions were made so you can improve your decision-making process rather than here's a dashboard to make a decision. We do do those occasionally, but we often find that what people think mentally is if there are humans and automation involved in a problem, that they think, well, the machine's going to make a bunch of decisions, and then I'm going to make the final choice. And we often find the reverse is true. I need you to make some key judgments about this customer or this transaction or this building. Once you've told me what those are, I can wrap those into an automated decision and do the so what, because the so what's pretty well defined, right? Yeah, you know, we have one example with a logistics effort where they had to pick a ship for a given logistics shipment. And there's all this stuff in there about predicting arrival times and departure times and whether it's, you know, obviously there's a bunch of rules about is it the right kind of ship? There's some analytics predicting its arrival time. Is it going to be available? You know, is it likely to need repair and all those things? But then there was one last bit, which is, is it seaworthy? Well, right. someone has to go look at the ship. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but that's not the final decision. That's one of the inputs. But someone's got to go do that. And so we see that a lot more often. So often we're like taking predictions taking some human judgment, and then wrapping that into an automated so what framework. In a solution like that, do you, are you also tasked with sometimes figuring out that whole end-to-end -end process? Like, let's say there actually does a guy with a camera or a gal goes to the dock and takes right. pictures of, and you know, this is maybe a bad example, but do you ever think about that holistic entire experience and clients are kind of realizing this is ultimately part of a decision 
mindset yeah. is that yeah, that's, yeah, literally sure. we have to include that part of this thing into it and we have to make that whole experience work and it has to work exactly yeah. yes i mean very much so we we often see for instance what people will start with is their first mental model of automation is i'm going to automate it and you're going to override it when it's a bad idea the problem with that is i don't really know why you override it and no matter how much work i've done on the automation you still have to do all the work again to decide if you're going to override it and one of my pet peeves is people say, well, the AI will tell you whether you should pay the claim or not, and it'll be transparent about why it came up with that, and then you can decide if you're going to pay the claim. And I'm like, well, but then I have to read the claim. I thought the whole point was I didn't want to read the claim. Yeah, that was kind of the point. Well, it depends on what the success criteria was, right? In that case, if the real goal was prioritize what stuff needs human review because there's so many claims coming oh, in. Oh, sure. Then right, the AI yeah. is providing decision support. It's saying likely, 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 likely. And you're like, check, 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 check really fast because you've you've accelerated that claims processing thing. If that was the goal. Yeah. If you trust the AI. Right. Right. Yeah. And the problem is, well, how do you d develop trust in the AI? Well, you go sure. look at the claim, right? So, right. So, you know, and so in the underwriting example, what we, what we had was, you know, there was a bunch of things that could be underwritten for like life underwriting that are very uh, rules-based. There's a life underwriting manual, certain things have to be true. We ask you these questions, right? And then what we found is there were places where we needed to make an assessment of your risk in certain areas, right? And so what would happen is we would try and decide with the data you'd submit it. And then if we couldn't decide, it would basically use a process to reach out to the underwriters and say, hey, look, we've got this customer coming. We don't need you to underwrite them so much as we need you to assess their, you know, how crazy a scuba diver are they? Because they said they're a scuba diver. We don't really know how crazy a scuba diver they are. And we know that the algorithm requires us to know if they're a casual scuba diver, right. a serious but safe scuba diver, or a nut job. You know, scuba diving alone at night in right. dark underwater caves. Yeah. Okay, so we're totally going to charge you extra for your life insurance. Right. <laughs> you know, and so... But we can't, you know, it's easier for you to do that or we can't do that, whatever, right? So then what the process is doing is it's reaching out to people to say the, the decision can't be made unless we, we get your inputs here, right? So instead of saying, I can't make the decision, here's all the data, blurt, you decide. It says, I can't decide because I need you to decide these two or three things. So you're, you're being asked for these very specific judgments in the context of this application, but you're not just being dumped back into the process, right? We're not just throwing it over the wall and saying, giving right. up, right? Abort and... <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And then yeah. the other thing we found is that once you do that, you start to identify, well, you can start to say, well, what are we asking Brian to do in this circumstance? Well, we're asking him to go look at this historical data and draw a, a conclusion about trends. Okay, well, trend analysis is something analytics are pretty good at. So maybe we could, in fact, use a machine learning model there at least some of the time, right? Versus... No, it's much more of a conversation, you know, with this very qualitative kind of stuff that we might go, okay, that seems like that's too hard to do with analytics right now. We'll continue to ask a person, right? And so by breaking out the role very specifically, you can be much clearer. My favorite one was a medical one where one of the key decisions as to for treatment selection was, does the patient look like they will survive surgery? And people are like, well, how are you going to automate that? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not going to automate that. I'm going to ask the surgeon. <laughs> you know, you know? And, and, the, and they said, well, why wouldn't you just let the surgeon override a bad answer if they didn't think you were going to survive surgery? And the surgeon themselves who was in the meeting said, well, because sometimes it's still the right answer. You're so sick. You're going to die if I don't do surgery. Right? So I would like the engine to say, even though I put in, I don't think Brian's going to survive this surgery. Then it might come back and say, well, too bad. You know, that nothing else has any chance of working except surgery. You're going to have to go ahead and try, right? Whereas if I say, well, he probably will survive surgery, maybe it would suggest surgery more often. If I say he's not going, it might suggest it less often. But that's part of the decision. It's not an override. Because once I override it, then I'm, I'm ignoring all the other bits of it, right? And so that, that, that for us has been, you know, the key thing. Once you focus on the decision at the end, you're bringing people in to provide their expertise as part of the decision making. And, and so we tend to design everything from that perspective, rather than the how can the computer help you make a decision? Which bits of the decision do we need you to make? And then, okay, obviously, we still have to ask, how can we help you make a good one, right? But what we're really trying to do is, is embed your decision making 
into an overall and effective decision making approach. Yeah, sure. I think you you've pointed out clearly too, in a, especially in a case like this with medicine, right, where the experience and participation of humans in the loop that are part of the decision making, right? It's we're not talking about complete automation, right? And there's these squishy subjective areas that you get into it. And, and what is that process? Do you feed data back into the model? Do you kind of go offline at that point and you take the machine's best guess plus the human and you go to some manual process? There's a lots of different ways to think about that, but that you have to think about how they're going to provide their insight and their thinking into the final decision to see if we're actually doing anything of value with any of this stuff, right? We have to holistically think about that operationalization to be successful. Absolutely, yes. I mean, and you know, medicine is a, is a good one because there's the physical interaction with the patient. We're doing some in manufacturing and some other places. And then there's the, you know, there's still visual inspections. There's still yeah. a sense, right? We talked to an independent system operator and, and one of the things they were like, people tell us which plants are going to be producing power next month. We don't always believe them. Okay, so I need a way to say, I know technically the data feed says these are the plants that are available for power generation next week. I don't think they'll be ready because, yeah, you know, I've talked to the head engineer over there and, and I, you know, I think they've got a more serious maintenance problem than they think they've got. So I think it's going to be at least another week. So I don't want to build an optimization that assumes this plant will be ready on Monday because I don't think it's going to be ready on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, you need to understand where that fits in the decision making. Otherwise, you can't really take advantage of it. You just have people who are, have this nagging sense that the, that the automated system is going to be wrong. <laughs> and that doesn't help anybody. Then, then, then they have the problem you said, which is like, it works, no one uses it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 95% accurate and it's used 1% of the time. Okay, well, yeah. then, you know, <laughs> knock yourselves yeah. out. You know? no, one's, no one's applauding. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. No, I, I, I defined in one session, I came up with this sort of dictionary definition of a valuable analytic. And I said, a valuable analytic is one where the organization that paid for it can identify a business metric that has been, note the use of past tense, improved because of the analytic, right? That means you have to have deployed it and it has to have had an impact on a metric that I track as a business metric. And I can say, here's my metric before the analytic, here's my metric after the analytic, that metric has improved and my competitors have not seen the same improvement from environmental factors. Therefore, the analytic is why my result is better, right? Once you apply that, it's like crickets. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening, anyone got one? And it's like, it's really quiet. Yeah. You know? Well, when we get it deployed, it will. You know, when it's fully rolled out, it will. When we apply it to the other 99% of the portfolio, it's definitely going to have a big impact. Yeah, okay, well, call me when that happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is the, the outcomes over outputs mentality, yeah, you know. Yes. <laughs> That's a big move for, it's a big leap for a lot of, in my experience, very technically talented people to make that change with the mindset that I, I'm really here to help the business or organization achieve yeah. outcomes. Outcome. Like it's, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's a big change. It is a big change, and, and it, it's very hard for people. They, they, they struggle with the fact that the right answer may be a very dull model, but with a very dull technique using very small amounts of data. Yeah. And, and that may be enough to move the needle. That's not what I yeah. got this PhD for. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Do you know how much yeah. that cost? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, you know, and so it depends, yeah. right? And, and, I, and I'm with you. If you really want to do research, then there are organizations out there that want to hire researchers. So go work for one, right? Yeah. yeah Microsoft, Google, these people have huge research departments working on techniques and, and yeah. everything else, right? Like Jim Goodnight used to say, he says, you know, I need to hire PhDs, he said, because I need to figure out how to make this stuff work for everybody, right? But you guys, you need it to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's a, that's a big shift for people. And, and I think not just for the individuals, because I think your point earlier is, is, is very valid. The way these groups are structured, the way they're motivated, the way they're paid, the way they're led, all of those things have to change too, because far too many companies just say, you guys are smart, figure it out, tell me what I should do. And it's just like, well, that's basically a waste of time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I think that's partly why learning how to frame problems and sometimes this means your your job may be to go and help the room the stakeholders the people 
extract a problem everyone can agree on and help them define that. And it, it may not feel like that's what I went to school for. That's not right. what I was trained to do. I, 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 but that is what is going to allow you to do work that matters. Yeah. Exactly. Work that people care about. And and someone needs to do that. And you know that, that's a big part of what I train in my work is otherwise you're just taking a guess and you're going to end up not being happy. Probably most people like to work on stuff people care about. Like, oh, we shipped this. It got used. It made a difference. Like it's so much more fulfilling, at least for me, it is yeah. to, to work on things people care about. So <laughs> I, I would agree with you completely. And I think we have to think about how we motivate and train and, and encourage folks. And I also think you know, my observation is the companies I work with that do the best job of this have much more of a mix of internal people that they've trained and external people that they've hired, right? They've got people who come in saying, I know that this is important to my company. You know, the way we interact with our partners, the way we interact with customers, never missing a customer order delivery date. You know, these things matter to, you know, I've been here a long time. We talk about it all the time. So when I look at a problem, I'm looking at how do I use analytics to make that better, right? I come in as an analytics person. I don't know your business particularly. Well, it's much easier for me to focus on the analytic as an outcome, right? That's what I, my job is, right? And so I think companies also need to stop trying to just hire everybody fresh from outside and set up a separate group and think much more about how do I infuse this overall analytic effort with people who really have a feel for what matters to the company. Right. Because then they'll be focused on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. James, this has been a great conversation, and I know you have a book, and so yeah. I assume that's a great way to kind of get deeper into your head. <laughs> so tell me about the book. Who is it for, and where sure. can my audience get it? The newest book is called Digital Decisioning, How to Use Decision Management to Get Business Value from AI. And it really is based on like 20 years of, of experience, mine and others, of trying to say, how do you effectively automate decision making so that you can take advantage of machine learning and AI and, and these technologies? And really lays out a, a methodology. It's only a couple of hundred pages, so it's a high level more aimed at like a line of business head or someone who's you know running an analytics group or running an IT department who's interested in this stuff. Lays out how do you go about discovering what kind of decisions you should focus on and then how do you build these kind of automated decisioning systems and figure out how machine learning and AI fits in that. So that's the that's the intent of the book. It's not it doesn't tell you how to build models. It doesn't tell you how to write rules. It doesn't tell you how to build a decision model. It just tells you when you should do those things and how they fit together, right? So it's much more of a overview book to help get people started. So that's a place to start. It's available on Amazon. It's Kindle. You know, there's a Chinese version and a Japanese version being worked on, but they're not available quite yet, but they will be. And so excellent. my publisher said, you've got to write it in less than 200 pages, James. And, and it is 199 pages, pages. Well, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> it's more or less exactly 199 pages. So, so yeah, because the problem with doing, as you know, right, the problem with doing something a lot is that you can talk about it for hours, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, but awesome. anyway, so no, that's that's the book. So, are you active on social media? I know you have a blog. Is that the best place to kind of watch your work or a mailing yeah, list? Yeah, you can What's watch the, the blog. I, and you know, the company has a website with a blog, and I have a blog at JT on EDM. Okay. I'm also on Twitter, uh, J A M E T one two three, Jame T one two three, no S. And that's pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. People, uh, you know, can find me. It awesome. can be hard to find me because my name is James Taylor, right? And there are lots of James Taylors. But I've been right. on LinkedIn so long that my profile is actually slash James Taylor. Oh, sweet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Well, the advantage of living in Silicon Valley is that, you know, <laughs> you know, you know I, I, uh, I got that's in there great. early. So, you know. Apparently, there's a big mark, by the way, just to end this. But did you there's like a there's a whole market, I guess, for people who get like the one letter handles and then they sell oh, yeah. them. Do you know yes. about yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this kind of stuff? Goes on all the time. If you ever try and buy a domain name that's got real words in it. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 And you know, I get all these complaints sometimes and that people are typing my email address because it's at decision management solutions dot com. And it's long. Yeah. And someone was complaining and he worked for one of these companies where in order to get the domain name, they basically misspell the name, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, really? It's like, you're complaining about the length of mine. At least they're all real words. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I haven't had to make something up. You know? Yeah, it's management uh, with an X. Yeah, oh, exactly. okay. Yeah. You know, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, yes. Decision, but D-E-X-I-S-O-N. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway. man. Well, James, all it right. was great to have you on Experience Week Data. Thanks for sharing all this great information about decision making. It's, it's, it's been fantastic. So You're most welcome. It was fun to be here and stay safe. Yeah. All right. You too. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Experiencing Data with Brian O'Neill. If you did enjoy it, please consider sharing it with the hashtag Experiencing Data. 
To get future podcast updates or to subscribe to Brian's mailing list, where he shares his insights on designing valuable enterprise data products and applications, visit designingforanalytics.com slash podcast.